Good morning. The Lord be with you. Um, and is she coming, Pat? So I think we have a lot of scurrying around, but we will go ahead and kind of get started. <laughs> Bethany's outside. And, you know, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> Hi, Bethany. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Should I start at the top? If you are joining us online, please bring your own Christ candle this morning, and we will light them together. <laughs> And we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper today. So please have some bread and wine or juice, some kind of liquid ready today. Okay. For announcements this morning, we are currently in a yellow stage. So please join us in person or online as you feel comfortable. And please wear a mask if you aren't vaccinated. Also, please be watching the newsletter and announcements and social media stuff for a very special gathering of all South Minister in May that will have a lot to do with the future directions we could take as a church. I believe Beth has some other announcements. Right, well, speaking of that, the um, group we are partnering with to walk us through a decision-making process about our land and our buildings and how they might be used for ministry and um, for more than just paying to get them mowed, which is kind of what we're doing now. Um, they have offered us two dates in May, and I just kind of want to do, y'all come on in, we're pretty informal here. <laughs> um, and I just kind of want to do sort of a very unofficial poll. And Jen, if you'll watch on Zoom for me. Um, the two dates they've given are Thursday evening, May uh, 26th, or Saturday morning, May 28th. Thursday the 26th is the day Metro schools get out, and Saturday the 28th is the Saturday of uh, Memorial Day weekend. But those are the dates we've got, so if I could see by show of hands, who would prefer Thursday evening? Okay. And on Zoom, Jen, do you have a? All right. And who would prefer Saturday morning? And on Zoom? Okay. Looks like that was it was about that clear in the nine o'clock service as well. So, all right. Second thing, on behalf of my husband, I am going to announce that the Scout House, um, they, you've probably heard some rumblings that they're trying to fix up the basement a little bit because actually the Scout Troop predates this congregation. And so it is definitely our oldest ministry. And um, to quote my husband, the space that they're using is kind of gross. And so we're trying to make it a little nicer on Saturday, the 21st, you can come have pancakes at the men's breakfast to which women are welcome, especially this time. And then they're going to go do some demolition and beginning cleanup down there in the scout house. So, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Let's worship. Oh, wait, that's me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Today, we're going to share the Lord's Supper. We're going to hear the words we say at the beginning of that whole thing. Those words are 1,700 years old at least. And so we consider what it means to sit at table together and whether we're here in the sanctuary or on Zoom and wherever and whenever you find yourself today, you are welcome at Christ's table. Thank you. Please join in our call to worship. Children of God, followers of Jesus, if you lift your net and it is empty, come. We will cast it out again into Christ's abundance. If you open your eyes, 
but do not recognize the Holy One, come and find the risen Christ here among us. If your life is filled with mourning, come. Come here, beloved ones. Risen Lord, we come to worship you, amazed and grateful at the invitation to your table, overwhelmed and awed by your generosity and grace. As we worship today, grant that we might know how deep, wide, long, and high your love and welcome are for all of us and for each of us. Amen. Please stand. Our joy at the resurrection and the immense grace it represents means that during the Easter season, we do not have a prayer of confession, but say together, rejoice, we are forgiven and called into new and abundant life. Amen. prayer for illumination and our first scripture reading this morning. You call us through your word, read and proclaimed, holy God. May our eyes be opened and our hearts willing to follow where your spirit leads us. Amen. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol. 
restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. The word of God for the people of God. out by now that we're starting a series on tables. <laughs> tables figured prominently in Jesus's ministry and life, and they figure prominently in ours. A lot of important decisions and conversations happen around tables. And today we want to look at the significance of how God sets an abundant table for us. Our scripture comes from the time we ourselves are in after the resurrection, but before Pentecost. And so the disciples are waiting for this spirit that Jesus has promised, and they probably weren't quite sure what to do with themselves while they waited. Some of them, well, all of them had seen the resurrected Christ once. Some of them had seen him twice, and they were probably a little disillusioned. The Roman Empire 
was still in power. They were still powerless in the political system around them. And so this kingdom of God that Jesus had told them was coming must have seemed very far off indeed. Well, the 12 men closest to Jesus, that little community had fallen apart. Judas had betrayed Jesus and was now dead. Peter was probably wrestling still with his denials of Christ. And all of them, except for John, ran away during the crucifixion. I have to wonder if they were not wondering where they stood with the risen Lord now. What was their relationship now? Hear God's word from the Gospel of John, chapter 21. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they all knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God today. So in the absence of clear instructions, the disciples returned to a place that they knew, Galilee, to do something they knew how to do, make a living by fishing. They were there, and I love the way it's listed here. Um, you know, it's this guy and this guy, name, 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 and two other disciples, which just it makes me think of Gilligan's Island, the original introduction, where the professor and Marianne were just, and the rest. <laughs> Um, but so Peter says, I'm going fishing. You can almost just hear him going, I'm going fishing because he's a man of action always. And nobody else had any better ideas. So they went with him. And then all night long, these career fishermen caught nothing. Then some guy on the shore starts giving them fishing advice. I wonder if they weren't a little exasperated and if they said, fine, he says, put the nets out on the right side, let's do it. We'll show him nothing's going to happen. And of course, the net is full, more than full. John clues in. He tells Peter it's Jesus. And then we have these strange details in this text. Peter puts on clothing and jumps into the water. That seems backward to me, but, you know, Peter, you do you. But Jesus invites them to have breakfast and to bring the fish they've caught. Again, another strange detail, 153 fish. Peter jumps back into the boat, helps them haul it in, and they join Jesus for breakfast. So in this meal of fish and bread, Jesus uses these deeply familiar things to show them how God sets an abundant table for us. And Jesus uses those things to show them 
who was really welcome at Christ's table. Deeply familiar things to see God's abundance and God's welcome. The food and the setting, so familiar. They had likely shared many, many similar meeting, meals with Jesus. It was food they'd eaten from childhood. I think it's funny that none of them dared to say anything to Jesus about it being Jesus. I imagine there were a lot of shared looks when Jesus was looking the other way and they were probably going to each other. <laughs> and as there was always with Jesus, there's this huge abundance. There was an abundant food, there was abundant grace, abundant joy, and abundant opportunities for new welcome and new beginnings. Now, in my study on this passage this week, I came along, along some medieval authors who said that number of fish, 153, that was symbolic of something. One person said it was the number of kingdoms in the world at the time, or it was the number of disciples in the early church. And I, before I do that, I need to share with you, if I can find it here, you all need to hear part of the um, children's sermon, if I can find it, and I can't. Oh, well, I will, here it is. <laughs> okay, so I, I had, for the kids, I had 153 goldfish crackers in a dish. They were very excited about that. And then I said, but what if they were this big? And, you know, they were very quick to catch on. They would not fit in that container. That's right. So I, and I also sent the um, goldfish crackers off with them to Children's Church and um, heard that there were a lot of instructions of one at a time because they wanted to eat them like popcorn. So here's my favorite thing I found about that 153 fish. That's a crazy amount. And why? Because that's how much God loves us. So in a sense, the number of fish is symbolic. It's symbolic of the abundance that follows Jesus around, the abundance of grace, joy, excuse me, love, and redemption. And what else was abundant at this breakfast? That sense of welcome at that table. Peter, who had denied Jesus, was welcome. Thomas, who demanded proof of the resurrection, was welcome. All those disciples who ran away from the crucifixion, they were welcome. And more than being welcome, they were given what we all desperately need to thrive, a chance to belong. So Jesus came to where they were and offered them familiar food. The Lord was with them, joining with them in their everyday lives. And this is what we proclaim at the beginning of our own communion liturgy, our own meal with Jesus. The Lord be with you. See, y'all know that. He invited them to bring what they had to the table, those freshly caught fish. What would happen if we did that? Oh, but we do. We break bread together every Sunday with our brunch between the services and we have always maintained and always will maintain that whatever you have to bring on a given day is good enough. Some days it's your day to spend a lot of time and effort and make croissants from scratch. Just kidding. None of us are actually going to do that. <laughs> or it's your day to grab those cheese sticks that are just about expired and bring them. And some days it's your day to bring nothing. And all of it is welcomed. Over the weeks to get, of eating together, we form community. We learn whose kids won't eat anything green. And we learn who doesn't like this or who's allergic to what. But we also talk about the mundane things, the once-in-a-lifetime events, the silly things, the serious things. We've had some strange food combinations, but we've never left hungry. I truly believe that when we share around those tables, it's very much like that breakfast on the beach. The Lord is in the midst of the people and the food and the conversations that have become so familiar. And there is an abundance of love, joy, and grace, just like Peter and Thomas and all the other disciples who had screwed up. We are welcome at that table. We're welcome to pull up a chair and dive in. 
you know, if this scripture passage is the Lord's breakfast, maybe that's the Lord's brunch. I don't know. Well, that brings us to the similarities between this meal with Jesus and the disciple in our scripture with our own brunches and the Lord's Supper, which we also call the Eucharist or communion. And like that breakfast and like those brunches, this meal is deeply familiar, full of abundance and full of over-the-top welcome. Remember how the disciples couldn't quite bring themselves to say out loud, it was the risen Jesus who was fixing them breakfast? Well, beginning in the early church, the proclamation of the Lord's presence became very important, and we still continue that. When we begin our time of communion, as we said, the Lord be with you and also with you, we are joining with Christians throughout history. We have documentation, historians have found documentation from uh, that, those exact words, the words we use at the beginning of our communion liturgy as early as 300s. So when we start out our communion with those words in a, in a, few, day, a few minutes, we're joining a very long line of the faithful in that proclamation. Now, that is followed, that proclamation, with an invitation to the table. And then, very similar, that invitation is very similar to Christ saying, come, have breakfast. And then we have the great thanksgiving. It's a three-part prayer. We sing a little bit in it. It's a prayer to God, to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, getting the whole Trinity, three persons in one. And I had an intern... Um, supervisor say he didn't like to use the great prayer of thanksgiving because it was so long you had to bring snacks and um, I just try to shorten it a little bit <laughs> so over time like the Lord's breakfast and our brunches these words and people and this setting becomes deeply deeply familiar we repeat them month in month out through the seasons, the ups and downs of our lives, we get the idea that like those first disciples, Jesus meets us in our ordinary everyday lives. And like those first disciples, we are offered over and over and over opportunities and invitations to transformation, to lives of meaning and depth and substance. <laughs> Like that early morning meal, like our brunches here, we find abundance at the table God sets. We have, in a way, our own version of that ridiculous net full of 153 fish. We remind ourselves and each other that God's grace for us is unmerited and it's unlimited and that we are invited into abundant living together as disciples. Now, our youngest folks get that. When CJ tears off a big old hunk of Jesus bread and dips it in the cup up to his wrist, he's just living into that abundance. And we do change out the juice before the next service. When little Aaron Lampley toddles up the aisle signing for more of this bread, I think on some level he really does sense that there is abundance here. And there is plenty. So he feels completely comfortable doing that. This morning, I was reading the prayer very, 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 very quickly because Aaron was crying to get to the bread. <laughs> I was like, far be it from me to stand between you and Jesus. Um, so they probably didn't have a literal table at that breakfast on the beach. But what they had was an extraordinary welcome. It is our hope, it's our intention that our, the tables at our brunches have that same kind of welcome. And this table, this communion table has that kind of welcome. Like that meal with Jesus, the doubters and the deniers are welcome. The frustrated and the frustrating are welcome. The screw ups and the overachievers, welcome. The sinners and the saints, we're all welcome. We keep proclaiming the invitation to this table, this meal, because God in Christ keeps inviting us to rediscover that abundance really is abundance when it comes to God. Why? Because it seems that God truly does love the world.
So you who are so beloved of God, you are welcome and truly welcome to share in the Lord's Supper or communion or the Eucharist by whatever name you are welcome. We will take this deeply familiar bread and cup. We will say these deeply familiar words. And at this table, we are fed with an abundance of love and grace and mercy and joy. And at this table, we are truly, truly with Christians from all times and all places. We are welcome. Amen. For our moment of generosity this morning, you are invited to prayerfully consider how God might be calling you to use your time, energy, love, kindness, and finances to be a blessing to others this coming week. For those who would like to contribute or our ongoing ministries of Southminster and Telos, you may use the QR code below or place a check or cash into the offering plate at the front of the church. Thank you. We stand. when we lift up one another and the concerns of our world and what um, concerns can we lift up together today? Bob. So Annette is not here because she's um, still dealing with some stomach issues from when she was hospitalized several weeks ago, and the antibiotics are just kind of knocking her for a loop, I guess. But all in all, she's doing well. So let's lift up our sister Annette. God, thank you for Annette and the joy and love she brings to us. We ask that you would help her to get over this next hurdle with recovery and restore her to us soon. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Are there others? Kathy. I forgot earlier that this is now the last of our homes. Don't forget our young And don't add their first grandbaby. Well, that is wonderful. I, I definitely know how that works. And um, all right, let's pray. 
God, thank you for another new little life, a little bundle of joy. We pray that you would surround this child and the parents and grandparents with your love. Lord, in your mercy. Um, Susan. I'm sure we can all think of a teacher who made a huge difference in our lives at one point. God, thank you for teachers, for um, the way they take on what seems impossible and do some amazing things. Lord, in your mercy. Are there others? And are there on Zoom, Judy, you said? All right, Judy. I'm asking our Zoom congregation for those. Uh, <laughs> prayers for Madeline as she starts her new life. She graduates on Friday with her doctorate in occupational therapy. Be with her in this new life ahead. No more schooling which I think is a bit scary for her, but be with all the kids who are graduating or changing their lives. Thank you, Judy. That is, I can't believe we have Dr. Madeline Watson. That's wonderful. So let's pray for Dr. Madeline. Lord, we thank you for the steadfastness and perseverance that has brought Madeline to this point. And we ask your blessing on her as she earns her doctorate and goes into the world to be an amazing occupational therapist. For all those who graduate, Lord, we ask that you would be with them in this time of transition, either um, away from school to new school, to just live in life. Lord, in your mercy. Are there others on Zoom? Bill. Prayers for Kim as her due date has arrived, and we're all waiting expectantly. And, uh, Nobody more than her, I am sure. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, she is very, very ready. Yeah, I always say that last stage of pregnancy is the butter knife stage where you say, I don't care if you use a butter knife, get it out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray for Kim. Lord, we pray for Kim. For all who are waiting with open hearts and arms for this baby, we ask for a safe and speedy delivery and um, good quick phone calls to grandparents who are eagerly awaiting the news. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Are there any others on Zoom? All right. Let's continue in our prayers together. Merciful God, hear our prayers for the church and the world, for all your children, no matter their place or position. Hear our prayers for the hungry, the overfed, for the mourners and the mockers, the victims and the oppressors. All are in need of your wisdom. All are in need of your love. All must be encouraged to hear and heed your call. As the psalmist says, deep calls to deep, yet we splash in shallow water. Call us to deeper relationships, holy God, by listening to each other in love, seeking the story beneath others' stories. Call us to practices of spiritual nourishment rather than the junk food that tastes good but fails to meet our deepest needs. Steep us in your word and in practices of prayer that stretch us and expand our potential. Surround us with community that calls us to account and encourages us to be our best selves.
No matter how far we wander, thank you, God, for always calling us home. We praise you for your grace and mercy. In these days of frustrating change, constant uncertainty, remind us that you are always our home, our safe place, our care and comfort. Thank you for the many ways you stand with those who are suffering and empower those facing unimaginable trials, those whose countries are at war. Speed the day, eternal God, when suffering will cease, when your people can rest, and all creation can know your promised peace. United as Christ's body, we lift these prayers to you, Savior God. Hear us now as we pray the prayer Christ taught us, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come to this table. You who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have shared in this sacrament often and you who have not been for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. There is plenty for all who would come, plenty of bread, plenty of cup, plenty of room at this table, and plenty of grace. Come for it is Christ who invites us to meet him here, and all y'all are welcome. We join with Christ's followers of all times and places in this ancient prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give thanks to you, O God, creator, redeemer, sustainer of all. You made your covenant with us, calling us to love and serve you. When we are wandering in sin, you forgive us and lead us home. And so we join in the heavenly hymn. We give thanks for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lived and died and rose for us, and he was coming in glory to reign. We give thanks for the ways of love Jesus teaches us to live into, the ways of justice Jesus calls us to live out. Remembering Christ's saving love, we celebrate this holy meal and offer ourselves to you, O God, with gratitude and praise. And together we sing the mystery of our faith. Holy Spirit, O oh God, on your people gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. 
By your spirit, make us one body in Christ, one in mission and ministry to the world. Nourish us in faith, hope, and love. Strengthen us for service until we feast with you in glory. All praise, honor, and glory are yours, holy triune God, now and forever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord sat at table with his disciples, and he took the bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And in the same way, at the close of the meal, Jesus took the cup, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This cup represents the new covenant poured out in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you celebrate my life and my death until I come again. The gifts of God for the people of God. And we will share the bread and cup. We ask that you would let the musicians come first and then all who need gluten-free. And um, then you can come up the center aisle. And of course, we have the self-contained communion for those of you who would prefer that. Let us pray. Gracious God, how can we thank you for such a gift? For you have met us, fed us, drawn us to you, and bound us to one another. Now send us out to share your love and proclaim our hope until Christ comes again. Amen. Please stand for our last hymn.
beloved of God, remember this. Christ is risen. Christ goes with you. Christ welcomes you at his table, and you can go into all the world with fierce hope and determined love and fear nothing. Amen. <laughs>